when we pull the goal down from like a 10 out of 10, like 10 out of 10 up here is like losing 30 pounds. And like a one out of 10 is like, I'm going to lose one pound, right? That's when we can start to layer and we can start to continue that forward momentum, right? Because once you lose that one pound, you're like, oh my gosh, that's great. It's been like two weeks and I've, I've already done it. All right, well, let's do it again. Welcome to the show. So excited to have you here. I just finished listening to all of your 2022 best of recap episodes on your podcast, and they are really fantastic. Uh, I know you have many fans of your podcast and your work at On The Levels team. So we're all really excited internally to have you on, and I know our audience will learn so much from you. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. Let's jump in. I think, you know, as we're in the new year, a lot of people are thinking about the food they're eating, the changes they want to make to their health. Um, I know weight loss is on a lot of people's minds. I'm curious from all of your experience, what are some of the biggest diet misconceptions that you see in your practice? Yeah, good. I think um, when, we, when we think about diet misconceptions, I think it's important to kind of zoom out a little bit and talk about the big picture because what often happens, you know, the new year comes around or, you know, there's a wedding that you want, that you know that you're going to be going to, or there's a high school reunion or, you know, whatever it is. And we set these incredibly aggressive goals for ourselves, you know, when motivation is really high, right? So the mo it's like, I'm going to get into that beautiful wedding dress or I'm, this is the year 2023 is my year. This is the year when I learn French, lose weight, you know, learn salsa, whatever it is. And when our motivation is high, we can very much, um, overshoot the target. So we might say, I can lose like a pound, if it's weight loss, I can lose a pound a week, you know, for six weeks and that's six pounds, or I can do it for 20 weeks and that's 20 pounds. And what ends up happening, of course, is over the course of that six weeks or 20 weeks or however the time frame is, like life happens, right? So, you know, the kids get sick or you have a really big deadline or you have to travel and you're off of your schedule again. And so I think that when we, one of the biggest misconceptions is actually setting too big of a goal from the outset and then not being able to follow through on it because, you know, by week, you know, we've all heard the, you know, the tropes of like the gyms are really busy January 1st, then February 1st, you know, they're empty. And the reason for that is, and it's, it's true, like gyms are busier in, you know, the first month of the year. And then we start to see this sort of steady decline back to like the regulars, right? By like February or March. And the reason for that is people go too hard, too fast. And the mm -hmm. same is true in diet, right? So you might say, this I'm going to do, like, I'm going to become a vegan this year. Like this is the year that I'm just going to cut out all meat or I'm going to do the ketogenic diet this year and no carbs shall pass these lips. Right. <laughs> and we, you know, and we are so, uh, black and white about it. Right. Like we're so strict and we adhere so, uh, fiercely, like we white knuckle, especially for women. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about how women are different than men when we're talking about diet, uh, application of diet, but, it's, we just, we do it so, uh, aggressively that it's so painful that you just give up. It's like, well, if this is what it is to be keto, like I'm having none of it, like this is too painful, et cetera. So I think that that's the biggest misconception around diets in general is that it has to be painful and that you have to do it at a hundred percent all the time in order for it to be effective. I completely agree with that. And I guess what would be your recommendation for people who are listening to this who are saying, oh, actually, that's me. I'm guilty of that. I just did that a few days ago. Yeah. How do you take the initial goal and modify it to something that is more likely to sustain motivation? Ah, oh, such a good, I love this stuff. Cause this is like, this is like getting into like the belief systems and the mindsets and like the behavioral psychology piece of it. So I can say that from people that I have interviewed myself and that I have learned from, and then just my own journey, like for all the people that are listening, like I am that type A personality. Like I was the girl that was like, I'm going to work out 365 times this year. Like it's going to, that's going to be me. Like I was that girl as well. Okay. So I just want like, there's no shame. Like I was totally her. And in many ways, I'm still kind of that recovering perfectionist. Like I still catch myself like overshooting and not prioritizing rest and all the things. So from, uh, conversations that I've had with thought leaders 
uh, BJ Fogg comes to mind, uh, Dr. Heather uh, McKee, who I just recently had on uh, on my show as well. She's a behavioral psychologist out of Ireland. One of the things, like kind of the through line when you're talking to behavioral psychologists is that they, they talk about making a habit uh, rather than focusing on the outcome, let's say, like I want to lose the 10 pounds or I want to learn the French, like I want to be fluent in French. Like some of those things sometimes are beyond your control. Like we were saying before, kids, deadline, travel, all the, you know, you get sick, whatever it is, get in the way. But what we can and what we do have control over is the tiny little daily habits that we do every single day. So whereas we don't necessarily have uh, control over the outcome, we have control over our behaviors. So one of the ways to kind of circumvent the big audacious hairy goal, right? It's like, I'm going to lose 30 pounds this year is, well, what is what does one pound look like? Can I, can I just set a goal to lose one pound, right? That's not overwhelming. You don't need a ton of motivation. You just need to take like one less bite of the dessert, you know, and maybe you just need to, when you're looking at your plate, maybe instead of eating a hundred percent of what's on your plate, you eat 80% of mm-hmm. what's on your plate. You know, that's, that's a much easier goal. And so when we pull the goal down from like a 10 out of 10, like 10 out of 10 up here is like losing 30 pounds. And like a one out of 10 is like, I'm going to lose one pound, right? That's when we can start to layer and we can start to continue that forward momentum, right? Because once you lose that one pound, you're like, oh my gosh, that's great. It's been like two weeks and I've I've already done it. All right. Well, let's do it again. Right. And then, and then that kind of creates that. I mean, there's a whole neurochemical cascade that we may or may not get into, but that creates some of that dopamine release, that hunger and that passion to continue to pursue that goal again, because you have the confidence and the self agency and the self trust now that's like, Hey, I did it once. Like I can totally do it again. And it's not that difficult. I just sort of ate until I felt full. I didn't just necessarily eat until the whole plate was gone kind of thing. So that's like the biggest takeaway. Like that's it. Like bring the 10 out of 10 goal down to a one out of 10. You know, if working out every day is the 10 out of 10, you know, what's the one out of 10? Maybe it's working out once this week and maybe it's a walk, right? And if you're able to overcome that initial, uh, you know, hump, let's say, then anything above and beyond that is going to be bonus. So all the type A ladies and men that are listening, you get extra credit, right? So it's like, you're like, oh, I already did this. And now here's my A plus, like here's the A plus piece of it, right? Rather than shooting so high that it needs, you need to recruit so much motivation, so many skills and assets, so much drive. It's like, well, I've already, I've already gone for a 10 minute walk. So what else can I do now? Mm -hmm. And something I love that you talked about on your podcast um, was this idea of the confidence that comes from knowing that you can trust yourself to do the thing, even if it's a small thing. And that over time, that belief and that confidence in yourself then creates this momentum. I just, I I think that really spoke to me. And and like you, I also am a recovering um, perfectionist or kind of aggressive goal setter where it feels like, you know, and working in this line of work, it's so easy to drop back into that where every book you read, every podcast, there's like a thousand possible ways you can modify your lifestyle. And you're like, I'm going to do all of them. I'm going to do all of them. Yeah. (laughs) By the time you do all that, you're like, by the time the sun is in my eyes and I haven't eaten the carb and I've gone to the sauna, it's like, there's no other life. And there's like, I got to work. Yeah. Like I got to get to work at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. We're going to go deep into more of these topics, but just two common questions that I hear a lot that I think you can really help in in clarifying for the audience. The first one is, what is the role of calorie counting for all the people out there that are really into my fitness pal um, or kind of like really into that version or that tool of of health management? What is your take on that? Is there utility in that? Is it helpful? Is it harmful? How does that play out? Uh, I mean, like anything, uh, any tool uh, can be used for good and it can be used for your detriment. So, um, you know, in the context of weight loss, and I should also just catch my own verbiage here. When we're talking about weight loss, of course, we're talking about fat loss. Like we're talking about reducing fat or total adiposity. We're not talking about reducing muscle weight. We're not talking about reducing bone weight or organ weight. Like any, like whenever we talk about weight loss, it's about reducing total adiposity, right? So, Whenever we're thinking about calorie counting, uh, we want to be sensitive. I certainly am sensitive um, for my female clients and women that I've counseled because it can, like anything, exist on a, you know, it can vacillate from, you know, 
an appropriate normal use of it all the way up to, you know, a, a, you know, disordered, you know, disordered eating and disordered behaviors that feed into kind of disordered eating and body dysmorphia and eating disorders. So I think that if you are someone who has a history of eating disorders, so anorexia, bulimia, anything like that, certainly you should be working with a professional, a uh, professional counselor or someone who specializes in those eating disorders. And you'll also probably find that those professionals will typically shy away from things like calorie counting. Because when we look at when we sort of look at anorexia or we look at bulimia, a lot of times these are trauma responses in many cases, but it's a play for control. And so you can see how if you're trying to control something, you're trying to control the food that you're taking in, let's say, um, that that can become uh, dysfunctional very quickly. Mm -hmm. So if you are someone who has an eating disorder or history of eating disorder, maybe you're working with a professional, I would definitely leave it to the professional to advise you in terms of what you should be doing. But for those of us who um, don't have a history of an eating disorder and are trying to lose weight, I do think that calorie counting can be useful, partly because what I've found in terms of uh, pattern recognition is that most people have no idea what they're taking in. Mm -hmm. And so I have run uh, a diet for many years. It's a female centric uh, ketogenic diet for women. It's like a metabolic intervention. We'll talk about it, I'm sure, at some point today. Um, but it's a temporary state, right? We're not in keto, like we're not in keto forever. But in order for you to get into ketosis, you do need to aggressively, in some cases, aggressively, in other cases, not so much. But with, with some people, you need to really clamp down on your carbohydrate intake. And mm -hmm. in order to do that, you need to have a sense of what your carbohydrate intake is. So for, uh, for those women, I do recommend things like, um, what's the one that my ladies like carb manager, no affiliation, just, you know, it's a, it's an app that everybody seems to really like. There's a, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, I've used, um, carbon diet coach in the past. I've used a uh, carb manager. There's, there's many of them that I like. So anything that generally counts your calories is, I think, a really good, uh, it gives you a good ballpark of mm -hmm. total calories, the macronutrient split, like how many carbohydrates you're taking in, how many fat calories you're taking in, how many protein calories. Um, and then it also gives you a sense of what your nutrient timing or your behaviors are like. Again, coming back to that behavioral psychology piece, a lot of our calories typically when we're unaware and we're not tracking tend to come in the evening, right? So you know, usually dinner for most people is the biggest meal of the day. Uh, it's usually when we get to sit around with family, if there's an opportunity to do that. And then of course, there's the after dinner wine and snacking, right? So a lot of our calories, I, I read a stat, I think it was 45% of our calories for most Americans, oh. uh, North Americans come after uh, 5 p.m. So this is something to consider uh, in terms of mirroring back to us when we are consuming our calories. So how much and when I think is also very important. And I'll say that like for me right now, I don't have an app that I'm actively using, but I've also, when I was first starting out on my ketogenic journey and I had a whole host of hormonal issues and menstrual cycle issues and all the things I was tracking because I was trying to get a hold on what the problem was. And one of the things that you'll hear me say over and over again, and I'll probably say it a couple of times in our conversation as well, is that the diet that you follow and the habits and the behaviors that you follow when you're, let's say, metabolically unhealthy are not going to be the same behaviors and habits and diet that you follow once you've healed that metabolic derangement or once you, once you are healthier, right? Which is the same reason why you'll hear me say like keto for women long-term is not a good idea. Like, I don't think that it's a good idea. Like, I think it's a nice intervention uh, you know, let's say if someone has a hormonal issue as I did, uh, maybe they have blood sugar regulation problems, um, as I've had many women, uh, you know, deal with over time, the ketogenic diet can be a very useful proxy to help attain an optimal fasting blood glucose level and, and some other parameters. But, um, I don't actually think that 
we should stay there for a variety of reasons. One of which is that it actually stops working for most women. Like most women will say, Hey, I was feeling really great for like three or four months. And then all of a sudden, like I started gaining weight and I was miserable and I couldn't sleep. And my period was, was once fixed is now kind of back to where it was again, or, you know, a whole host of other kind of symptoms. So thyroid also can go amok. I've also seen thyroid in, in many, many women who do the ketogenic diet for too long can go, uh, can, can kind of bonk as well. Let's actually dive more into the keto diet. And I want to start by saying, I so, so appreciate your bringing awareness to the ways that male and female physiology is different. And that many of these interventions that have been so publicized really are based on studies in men or maybe work in certain ways in men and work differently in women. Um, and I think it's just now that that's starting to be recognized. And I wish, for example, I, so I started keto probably about a year ago. Um, and like you were describing for me, I really couldn't make it work unless I basically cut out all carbs and even some vegetables. Like I was eating arugula, basically. It was like, it was really extreme for me to get there. You were licking a celery and putting that into carb management. Exactly. Yeah. And it yeah. was, you know, and, and I had friends who were like, this can't possibly be right. And I was like, no, keto is right. Um, and, you know, and, and kind of like you described, I think in some ways it was helpful to me, but pretty quickly after a few months, I started gaining weight and I never felt good. Um, can you talk a little bit about your approach to adapting keto for women? Sure. Yeah. I think this is a very important topic, which is also often misrepresented, as you were saying, both in the literature and I would say in the online spaces that are just like mm -hmm. where diet dogma and even just diet culture um, is discussed. I think that um, and I'll, and I'll put keto, I'll put every type of diet in this category. Like there seems to be, um, and I, and I don't know if it, this is maybe a different question. This is just me pondering and thinking like, why do people get so crazy about diets? And I think that maybe it's because, you know, in, you know, back in, you know, prior to 2023, uh, I think that, and maybe in the last call it 30 to 40 years, uh, less and less reliance on religion right? So like less and less people going to church, less and less people in these sort of communal, let's say, uh, organizations. And so diet becomes the, you know, the replacement for uh, Christianity or, you know, whatever, whatever it was, you know, maybe if you went to church every Sunday, now you're going to the, uh, you know, now you're going to carnivore church or whatever it is, right? <laughs> like you're, you're adhering to something you want to belong. Cause I think humans in, innately want to belong somewhere to something. We want to belong in community. And I think for many years, you know, the church and, you know, kind of religious, uh, offerings kind of fed that need. And now I think in modern society, we aren't as reliant, let's say, on our pastors and our rabbis and wh whomever. And so we we are trying to figure out a way to fit in somewhere. And so you'll find that people will be like, well, it's going to be the way that I eat because it's something that we have to do every single day. We have to interact with food in some capacity every single day. And you kind of see this online. You sort of see really, um, we'll say, uh, set in their ways, people who talk about carnivore, people who talk about the ketogenic diet, people who talk about plant-based and veganism. I went off on a little path. I'll, I'll course correct myself here, but I, I just wanted to bring that to light because I think that sometimes when we want to start a diet, we start looking at people online who talk about that diet. And, you know, you might hear someone, you know, you said I was not able to eat plants. Well, there's some you know, people in the ketogenic and carnivore community that say, Hey, if you don't eat like plants are terrible for you, plants are going to create oxalates and you know, the seed like plants want to kill you. And so you hear that and you're like, well, gosh, this person has so many fault, like a best selling book, or this person has so many followers, like they must be right. Or they have a, they have a couple of impressive letters behind their name. They must be right. And then I think that we can, um, unintentionally, uh, guide people down the wrong path. So for a female-centric ketogenic diet, someone who might consider a, a female-centric ketogenic diet is the woman that I used to be. So someone who, let's say, doesn't have an optimal menstrual cycle. So I wrote about this in my book, but I'll kind of share with your audience. Like I used to hate my period. I used to literally feel like it was a curse. Like this is my, you know, this is what happens, for, you know, for being a woman. Like every month I was on very, very heavy painkillers. I had to take a day or two off of schooling at the time. Uh, I would be immobile. Like I would have to stay like the day in bed, cramping, like severe cramping, like whole, like lower back all the way down to kind of my knees. Couldn't really function. Like all of my activities of daily living were not, I wasn't able to 
uh, wasn't able to, to, par to participate in them. Um, and didn't think that it was anything to do with the way that I was eating. You know, I was, um, didn't think it had to do with any of my stress levels or the way, you know, some of my unprocessed stressors that I had experienced in my life. And I found the ketogenic diet just naturally through my own uh, interest because I've always been, I, you know, my undergraduate degree uh, is in neuroscience and psychology. So always very, like I've always had this long standing love affair with neuroscience, um, psychology, the brain, and, you know, my, my professional training is, um, as a, as a chiropractor. So the neuromusculoskeletal system is kind of my jam. Like I want to know everything about the brain and the muscles and all the things. So keto was a very natural kind of complement to my already stated interest there. And, uh, I was, I was, I first started reading about it, um, I probably, I'd probably say like 20, maybe 15, 2016 is when I really got really interested in it. And I was reading about the history of it. It was used as a, before there were seizure, uh, medications, the ketogenic diet was used to actually control grand mal, uh, like tonic clonic seizures mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in children. And then of course the advent of medication, uh, you know, negated the, the, the need for the diet, but insofar as, how we might think about the ketogenic diet is restricting and clamping down on carbohydrates temporarily. And the carbohydrates that you do eat is a lot of plants. So that is, um, you know, maybe where I differ from other people. I know there's more people that talk about this now, Dr. Sarah Godfried and myself, very, very, I know she's, I think she's a, an advisor at levels. Um, but her and I are very, very aligned on this idea that when you are going to do keto for a woman, um, that the carbohydrates that you're consuming are like, if you're building a plate, it should be like colors of the rainbow. We should have a mm. lot of green leafy vegetables, like the spinach, the artichokes, the arugula, as you were saying, the set, like lots of greens, but then also like the peppers and the eggplants and the, you know, all, all different colors. Um, and then when we are thinking about protein, again, the way that I structure a female centric ketogenic diet for women is there is a moderate amount of protein. So you're not uh, kind of classical keto would be like a four to one where it was like 80% fat. And then like maybe like the fill of like the, the last 20% was kind of split between protein and carb and like no carb, like almost no carbohydrates. I do like about 10% of the diet coming from carbohydrates, all of that, I would, I like it to be vegetables, uh, mostly vegetables, let's say, um, protein is about 20 to 25%. So kind of visually, if you're, if you're watching this or if you're not, and you're just listening, it's kind of just like the, the inner part of the palm. Like if you sort of look at your palm, it's like, okay, that's a serving size of protein. And then the fat is the fill, right? So if you're building, like if, if you're looking at the plate and you have like your, maybe you have some roasted Brussels sprouts and you have some, um, you know, you have some arugula, as you were saying, and then there's like some, a lean, uh, maybe there's a filet mignon or a chicken breast or something like that. And then you can kind of like drizzle some olive oil on the top. That's sort of the fill of it. And, you know, we have to think about fat being much more calorically dense than both carbohydrates and proteins. It clocks in at nine, uh, cals per gram compared to four, uh, for the carbohydrates and the, and the protein piece. So, um, you know, kind of drizzling, like, you know, very liberally drizzling olive oil can very quickly add up in terms of your caloric, uh, intake. So that is a, a basic ketogenic diet, let's say a basic formulation of a female centric ketogenic diet. Um, the way that I like to uh, employ it is that you would kind of do that macro split, like we would figure out what your calories are, but you would do that macro split for at least one menstrual, like one cycle. So about 28 or 29, let's call it 29 and a half so, or so days, right? Um, and then we'd reevaluate and see whether or not we need to repeat that or we start moving into protein and carbohydrate cycling, which is where we start increasing protein and carbohydrates as it coincides, if you're a woman in your reproductive years, as it coincides to your menstrual cycle. If you're in menopause, uh, you can still cycle. You just don't have to be like, am I in week one or am I in week three? Like it's just like on and off, right? It's like one week keto, one week high protein, one week keto, one week high protein, uh, higher protein and carbs. So that's how uh, I like to structure it. And then we, and then I sort of overlay a couple of other things on top of that in terms of like training and exercise as well with your cycle. But that's how I think a proper ketogenic diet should be structured for women. Women are exquisitely like, I'll say 
orders of magnitude more sensitive to our environment than men are. So we are very sensitive to changes in calories. So if we are calorically restricting for a long time or your body fat levels get too low, you're going to lose your period or your peri- your menstrual cycle is going to become irregular. You're going to cause hormonal derangement. You're going to cause metabolic derangement and like maladaptations to it. Um, and so I think that the initial sort of therapeutic intervention where we're doing keto, same, same every single day for a cycle. I don't like that to be, unless if there's like a very extreme case of maybe there's like a PCOS uh, patient, or maybe I have someone with, you know, maybe she has Hashimoto's, let's say thyroiditis and like carbohydrates are actually aggravated. Mm-hmm. There's a whole reason why that is. And we can maybe get into it, but so, uh, I find a lot of women with Hashis um, have a lot of, um, gut dysbiosis. Like there's a lot of hyperpermeability of the gut, the bacteria is kind of off. And so when we're giving them uh, a lot of carbohydrates, it can cause a lot of GI distress. So like a temporary underlined, double underlined, highlighted temporary elimination of carbohydrates is often, I find that I found that to be well tolerated with someone with an autoimmune condition, Mm -hmm. but the goal always with someone with autoimmunity is actually to add those those items back into the diet over time. Um, so that's how I would, that's how I typically structure uh, a ketogenic diet for most women keeping in, you know, trying to look through the lens of like, what's the hormonal derangement here? Is it estrogen issues, androgen issues, thyroid issues, uh, blood sugar regulation issues, and then kind of, you know, tweak it or nuance it for that, for that person. And then once we've had that therapeutic intervention, then we move into like the cycling because I, you know, I like in it, I like higher, I think protein is, you know, even just the word, like I'm kind of a word geek. Like, you know, if we look at the, if we look, if we break down the word, uh, protos, like so protein comes from the Greek word protos and a So it's like first nutrient. Mm. Is basically what it means. So, uh, and that's that's a shout out to all the Greek people that are listening. I hope my <laughs> accent didn't insult you too much, but that's that's what it means. It means like you know first, right? So we want to be thinking about, and every single cell in the body uh, requires protein to, uh, you know, for a variety of different reasons. Um, so protein is very important, and so is carbohydrates, especially for women. Like I'm I'm cool with like restricting carbs for a little bit of time, um, but what ends up happening is as you were mentioning, you know, you said like you tried it and then you started gaining weight. Well, what happens is be- when you're restricting the carbohydrate, you're like, all you were eating, what did you say? It was like arugula. It was, the only it was like thing arugula with olive yeah. oil on it. <laughs> it's like, okay. Like at some point, you know, you're going to become nutrient deficient if that's all that you're consuming. Um, and you're going to have, as I was mentioning before, some of those metabolic maladaptations, right? Like your, your basal metabolic rate is going to drop your calorie, your caloric expenditure, uh, is going to drop. So even if you're doing like the exact same workouts, right? Like you're, you know, maybe you're a runner or you're lifting weights or whatever you're doing, you're going to actually start burning less and less calories doing the same amount of work because your body's trying to conserve energy, right? Your, your digestion is going to slow all these different, all these different things that we don't want to happen when you are overly restricting, um, for, for a long period of time. So, um, I, I hope that that answers your, your question. I know I went on a couple of different tangents there. It, it does. And it's so helpful. And I wish that I had heard this exact conversation a year ago. Um, and I think it's such a reflection of how steeped we can get, or I can get in terms of what you believe you've been told or have read is the healthy thing. Because right. I remember being on keto and it got so restrictive. And there was part of me that was saying, this can't possibly be right. And the other part was like, I have to have this type of blood sugar curve. And this is the only way I can get it. And I believe this is right. This is what everything says. So I just have to do it despite what my body's telling me. And even when I started gaining weight, and like you said, I think I got kind of increasingly malnourished despite gaining weight. Yeah. Um, and it, it took really a long time before I was finally like, this is enough. Like, this is not right for me. I can feel it for sure. And so many women get scared of the carbs. Like that's the other, that's the other piece too, right? It's like, once we see these positive, like you go on keto, you restrict, let's say you bring your carbohydrates down mm-hmm. to whatever level, 10% of it or whatever it is. Um, and then women will lose weight and they'll be like, Oh, it was the carbs <laughs> all along. That's what it was. And then we develop this mm-hmm. disordered, approach to carbohydrates. We think now we can't have carbohydrates anymore because they're not good for us. And if we have carbohydrates, well, that's just the worst thing in the world. Right. And of Mm -hmm. course, 
time and time again, I can tell you that when I have these, I have that woman, like I have that, I have a conversation with that woman almost every week now. And we put some carbohydrates back in her diet. And she's like, I don't know what the hell we're doing, but I'm losing weight. And it's like, yeah, Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you need carbs because your thyroid is dying. Like you you need like just, you know, I won't get into the whole thyroid mechanics, but I will say that insulin, which is the um uh we'll say the hormonal response to consuming glucose, carbo- like carbohydrates break down into glucose and then insulin is re- released from, you know, the beta cells in the pancreas. Insulin is a requirement to convert inactive hormones of thyroid T4 to active hormones, uh, the active hormone of thyroid, which is T3. So if you are constantly in a insulin deficient because you're not having any glucose whatsoever, first, your body also has, because glucose is so important, your body has this ability to create its own glucose through a process called gluconeogenesis. But you are, you are going to now compromise thyroid function, which is an essential organ like it's an essential endocrine organ for your metabolism. Like the goal of your thyroid is to help get substrate, right? Like part of the, part of what th- like active thyroid hormone does is when you're eating or even just en- not eating, you know, any cell in the body, we're, like we need to get the substrate, like the glucose or the amino acids or the free fatty acids into the cell. The thyroid uh, hormone. And when thyroid hormones and the thyroid gland is working in the way that it should, this is how we actually get substrate into the cell to create energy. Yeah. That, that, it makes so much sense. And for people listening to this who are thinking, let's say they're on a keto diet, these are women, and now they're realizing they do need to reintroduce carbs. When you start to cycle women back onto kind of carbs and maybe going off and on from a lower carb to a higher carb, how high are the carbs? Like, are we talking about eating rice again, or is it more like just carbs, vegetables that are higher in carbs? Like, how how much carb do you it's see? Like, as are we going enough? to Hagen Dazs? Is like, is this <laughs> like, the question? Yeah, like, are we yeah. full on eating pasta again, or <laughs> yeah, yeah. what is the situation? <laughs> yeah, I think for a lot of women who've been on the ketogenic diet for a long time, there is actually a little bit of not not a little bit. There is a quite a bit of insulin resistance, right? Because there has been no need, right, for this insulin. Um, to kind of be around, we actually become a bit insulin resistant. So when we're starting to introduce, reintroduce carbohydrates for a woman who's been on the ketogenic diet, let's say, or restrictive, overly restrictive ketogenic diet for a long time, I usually like to start with complex carbohydrates. So things like yams and sweet potatoes and like root vegetables, like turnips, things like, things like that. Uh, squashes are really great as well. Squashes, actually, I just learned this. I didn't know this. Technically a fruit. All squashes are technically a fruit because they have wow. seeds. I know. I, did I didn't know. That. I thought they were vegetables. Yeah. Same. So squashes are really great. So like spaghetti squashes, butternut squashes, all these things. These are, and of course you can't eat those raw. Those have to be like steamed or, co- you know, roasted, that kind of thing. Those are really great places to start. And uh, kind of taking a chapter from Dr. Casey Means in terms of nutrient timing, I think that it's important that if you are, and I have rice and I have pasta as well, like now, like, you know, I don't have like piles and piles of it, but I do have some on the side of my plate. Um, but that's usually the last thing that I eat, right? So, you know, uh, Dr. Uh, Means was on my uh, on my show and she was talking about the value of nutrient timing. And we were talking about this as a function of the postprandial glucose curve. And she was talking about this idea of fat and protein. If we consume fat and protein first, and then the carbohydrate because of the speed with which those, those, um, foods exit, right. And they can get kind of spilled into the bloodstream. If you're having the carbohydrate, like the rice or the pasta or the squash or whatever it is last, you're actually, if you're concerned about your blood sugar, this is actually a really beautiful way to tamper down or like kind of pull down the amplitude of that post-meal blood glucose spike. That makes sense. And how about protein? I think you, you've talked about how many women are under fueling on protein. What are the best sources of protein? I know I have a lot of friends who are trying protein powders. People talk about collagen as kind of being the miracle supplement. What is your approach to protein and the best sources? Yeah, this is a good question. I think for me, um, it depends on what the protein is being used for, right? So if we are thinking about it from a body recomposition perspective, so we're thinking about it as 
I'm a woman who is in her 40s or 30s or 50s or whatever, and I or man, and I want to be putting on more muscle, which I hope pinky, pinky, all my, all my, all my fingers are crossed in, in terms of that being a goal for everybody listening. That should absolutely be if there are goals that you are setting for yourself over the long term, maintaining the muscle that you have or creating new muscle should be part of that. If it is for that specific purpose, collagen is not the answer. The answer is going to be in uh, more animal-based proteins or foods that are rich in leucine. Um, so I am a big fan of uh, animal proteins. I understand that there are people who don't like to eat, uh, you know, animals uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, you may be vegetarian, you may be vegan, let's say. And I think that you can still get there. Like you can still meet those kind of minimum protein requirements for body comp, like for the, for the purposes of like creating new muscle, be, being a vegan or being a vegetarian, I just think it's much harder. So you really do need to do your due diligence to make sure that you're getting the full complement of essential amino acids when you're consuming, let's say plant foods that have protein, like the legumes and the beans and that kind of thing, which are great sources. Like they are great plant sources uh, of protein. You do have to be mindful that they also have carbohydrates. Like, you know, beans have higher, uh, you know, let's say percentage of carbohydrates than like an, an equivalent, you know, piece of chicken breast mm. or lean ground beef or something like that. Um, and you usually have to consume more. Like you have to usually consume a lot more. So even if we look at, pow like you mentioned powders, right? Like the animal-based powder would be whey, like a whey uh, protein powder. Typically when you're looking at most whey, I mean, there's some, there's gonna be some variability with brand to brand, but most whey is like one scoop is somewhere between 20 to 25 grams of protein of which about 10% of that is leucine. So two to two and a half grams, let's say, of leucine. And that's about the minimum requirement that we need to start that process of muscle building. Mm -hmm. So there's a process in the body called muscle protein synthesis, fancy name. It's just talking about what it's doing. It's just creating new muscle proteins. And you need about two to uh, about 2.5 grams uh, of that to kind of start the process, right? For a uh, equivalent, let's say vegetarian uh, or we'll say vegan, uh, protein source. Like let's say it's, um, a lot of protein powders that are, uh, vegetarian or vegan. They might be like a rice, uh, protein. It might be soy, pea protein. Um, trying to think of some, those are the kind of like the big ones, uh, that I see. They are, have a much, uh, lower percentage of leucine. So, it, so in order to kind of get that 2.5 kind of minimum viable dose to start that MPS, that muscle protein synthesis, you're going to be needing to take two scoops, sometimes three scoops of the protein. So you also have to consider the calories that you're taking in as well. Usually what we find with vegetarians and vegans is that they have a hard time modulating their calories in, in, in order to kind of get the amount of protein that they need. So um, animal proteins are by far my favorite. Now I know that there is a lot of problems with the way that animals like kind of in the conventional, uh, you know, conventional feedlots. And I, I, I'm in full agreement with, uh, some of the ethical, um, uh, arguments that are, that are brought up by vegans in terms of like the way that animals live and the way that they're mm -hmm. killed and all, and, and like the living conditions. Uh, I am a big fan of regenerative agriculture. And I think that that is something that, you know, maybe a different conversation, but I think like I eat a lot of animal protein. I understand and I'm grateful for the sacrifice that that animal has made in order to sustain my life. I recognize that that's what's happening. Um, so I think that that is the best, uh, protein source. If we are thinking about it in the context of body composition, if we are thinking about co like if we're thinking about beauty, which I also really am into, uh, <laughs> collagen is actually great, right? Collagen, um, I, there's been several studies that have looked at like three months of collagen supplementation, uh, having a st like a statistically significant difference in terms of the amount of collagen in uh, in the fa like in the skin, in the hair, and in the nails. So like we all want kind of like shiny hair and strong nails and like, you know, that glowy skin and collagen supplementation does seem 
to uh, be a great like oral supplementation of it. Like I'm not so sure about like the creams that say, hey, we have like collagen in the <laughs> cream. Like I'm not sure about that, but oral supplementation, the studies do clearly show that after three months of like continued supplementation, there is a statistically significant difference in terms of bumping up the amount of collagen in the skin, hair, and nails. So from a aesthetic point of view, uh, you might say, yeah, I'll put like some, a, coll- a scoop of collagen in my protein shake. And then from like a, you know, from a body composition point of view, like I'll take one scoop of the collagen and then the other scoop will come, let's say from the whey protein or whatever the source is that you're using. That, that makes sense. So it's, it's kind of a buffet of uh, protein sources there. Yeah. Yeah. For optimal. Okay. One more diet based question and then we'll switch gears a little bit. Intermittent fasting for women and men, but I'm especially interested in it as a tool for women. Um, I think my personal experience with intermittent fasting, and to be fair, I didn't try it for very long, but it felt very stressful to me. Um, not simply because I was outside the habit of when I normally eat, but really it felt stressful in my body. I- I'm curious kind of how you approach that and if there are signs that it is helpful for some women and maybe not for others. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's like, you're going to hear me kind of say the same thing in a different way with everything. It's like, it's a tool. It can be manipulated for, you can like pull some levers with fasting to have some really great changes in metabolism. And then it can be taken to the extreme where, you know, in the same way that I've had women say to me, I do cardio seven times a week and I've been doing keto for three years and I fast for 16 hours a day and I don't know why I'm gaining weight in my belly, right? So fasting can also be overdone. Mm -hmm. Again, women exquisitely sensitive to our internal and external environment. So fasting in its pure form, like there are many different types of fasts, but let's just, you know, a fast uh, like a, a pure fast is where you're not taking in any calories. Maybe you have a cup of black coffee or, you know, you're drinking water or there's like herbal teas, like there's no calories there. Um, doing that for 16 hours a day, every single day. If you are a woman who's in her reproductive years, I am not a fan of that. And I will say in the vein of openness and honesty and transparency, I used to do that. Okay. So I used to see all the guys online that I really looked up to, like all the, you know, kind of keto experts and medical doctors and all the people. And I was like, gosh, like they're doing like a seven day fast. Like I should do a seven day fast, (laughs) not taking into account where I am in my cycle, Mm -hmm. that I'm not a man, you know, and I, like, as you were saying, it felt really, really stressful. And there was one time I remember it was a couple of years ago, I was moving um, I was moving homes and I had decided like, I, sometimes I'm like, <laughs> where are the brains? No, like no brains that week. But I was like, this would be a really great time to fast. Right. So it's like, not only am I like taking boxes, like up and down, unpacking, like any, anyone who's ever moved is like the most stressful thing. Right. Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, I'm adding another stressor on it, which is like, I'm not giving myself any food. And there was a point, it was like maybe five days into the fast. And I was like, I think I'm going to pass out. You know, like I felt so lightheaded. And then I sort of caught myself and I'm like, what am I doing? Why don't I just eat? Like, I, why can't this kind of be more of an intuitive mm-hmm. thing? So for someone who is very metabolically ill, okay, so, um, and this is actually a large percentage, unfortunately, of the population um, where we might see things like obesity, uh, pre-diabetes or diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, um, you know, kind of the big, you know, and any sort of these big lifestyle diseases. Mm -hmm. And then for women specifically, women who have androgen dominance. So there's like too much, too much testosterone. Uh, one of the conditions that can uh, happen from that is called PCOS or polycystic, uh, ovarian syndrome, where we're, uh, not having regular, sometimes not having regular menstrual cycles or anovulatory, like they miss cycles. So they don't kind of know where they are. Um, fasting can be a really, really great tool. So it can, it also can be a really great tool for women who are, uh, estrogen dominant as I was, but I'll, I'll just put that off to the side for a moment because there's a different way that I like to fast for those women. But the pure fasting, right? So it's like the PCOS women, uh, anyone who is like overweight, let's say, who has a higher fasting blood glucose than than what they would like. Um, and I know that there's like different ranges. Uh, some traditional doctors might say like anything under 100 milligrams uh, per deciliter is normal. I actually like a fasting blood glucose level somewhere like low 80s, like high 70s, low 80s is kind of where I like to see people in the morning. 
Um, but, uh, people who have blood sugar dysregulation, PCOS, which often has its roots in like hyperinsulinemia as well, really respond beautifully to like more of that pure fast, right? So like where we are fasting for maybe 12 hours or 14 hours, even 16 hours and some, depending on the severity of the case, like it might be 24 hours, um, something like that. But a five day fast is not something. And like, I wasn't so metabolically unhealthy. I was just doing it because I was like, I want to keep up with the guys. Like if they can do it, I can do it. You know, like Mm -hmm. there was literally no reason for me to do it. Um, Mm -hmm. but I think for women where we're seeing some of these hormonal derangements, like androgen dominance, let's say, or blood sugar dysregulation, that kind of thing, fasting can be a really great tool. And I want it to be gentle. Like I don't like long fasts. I used to really like them and I've softened, let's say, uh, in my approach with fasting quite a bit with women in that same vein, right? Like we are much more sensitive to our environment. So if you take away food to a body that is trying to develop and mature a follicle, you are going to impact ovulation, Mm -hmm. right? So we want to be, we want to be very mindful of some of the physiological differences and the physiological demands that a woman has that are separate and unique and distinct from that of our male counterparts. Like I'm raising three sons. So I love men and I want to raise like three strong, beautiful men. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they have their own set of problems, right? Like decreasing testosterone. And like, there's like kind of an estrogenization that's happening with men and like a testosteronization that's kind of happening with women. But I think that for women, we want to be much more gentle in our approach across the board. So if you're someone who's fasting for 16 hours every single day without consideration for your cycle, Mm -hmm. um, maybe I would invite you, maybe doesn't, maybe I'm wrong, uh, but I would invite you to just consider like why you feel like that's necessary right? There's certain times of the month where, you know, as we kind of go through the cycle where we are less hungry, which is typically in the first two weeks of the cycle, which is called the follicular phase, which is all about the follicle. The whole point of the first half of that cycle is to develop one follicle so that that follicle can release an egg. Um, So we typically are less hungry on bleed week and then the week before we ovulate. And then we're hungrier after we ovulate. Uh, There's a few reasons for that. One of them is under the influence of progesterone, uh, which does have a stimulatory effect on appetite. We we tend to be a little bit more inflamed. You know, if you do have uh, estrogen dominance, let's say, uh, you can be a little bit more inflamed. Like, you know, your rings don't, you can't get your ring off. You feel like you're holding water, tender breasts, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so in the second half of the cycle, fasting should be much gentler and much more different. You know, in the, in the first half, you can afford, you know, a 24 hour fast if you want, or a 16 hour fast, but it shouldn't be the same, um, all the way through. And I wanted to just come back, um, before I forget to my estrogen dominant ladies, like the, if you are someone who suffers from PMS, as I did for many years, like the tender breasts, the mood changes, sleep dysregulation, you're hot, you're cold, you're hot, you're cold. Your husband can't do anything right. Your children are you know, driving you nuts. <laughs> um, I do like a different type of fast for these women. So I, um, I talk about this in my book, but I call it a caloric liquid fast. So like we've been talking basically about a non-caloric fast, right? Like the water, the coffee, the tea, that's like what I would refer to as a non-caloric liquid fast. A caloric liquid fast would be like a bone broth, right? Or like a protein sparing, call it, um, uh, fast where we are having things like the collagen as we were talking about. So you may be having bone broth, which is going to give you a lot of collagen. It's going to give you a lot of glycine, which is really important. One of the hallmarks that a lot of women with estrogen dominance uh, report is a lot of GI dysfunction. So a lot of like gassiness, bloating, distension, let's say in that second half of the cycle. Um, so consuming a lot of that bone broth, it can be even a minestrone, you know, it can be a chicken soup, that kind of thing. So you're still having some proteins, um, and you're getting a lot of the, uh, you know, sort of reparative proteins that we were talking about, like the collagens, um, you know, and when you break down collagen, it's like, we have the glycine and some of these other Uh, amino acids in there. So that's how I like women who uh, experience a lot of estrogen dominance. That's how I really like them to fast. And it's usually in the second half of their cycle where we might have like a day of just bone broth. Like it might be just a day of minestrone or a day of like chicken soup, that kind of thing, um, where you're still having protein and you're having some calories. So 
some fasting purists may say that's not a real fast and I'm fine with that. Um, <laughs> but they can, you know, you can, you're still having some calories, but you're giving yourself kind of a bigger bolus, let's say, mm -hmm. of some of these proteins that are going to be reparative and healing to that inflammatory process that a lot of women can experience. I really love that you refer to it as healing because I think that's the piece that so often gets missed for people, like I said, who, where I've often been this person where it's, it's almost like I can set my mind to it and I will do whatever it is that I'm supposed to do, but it doesn't necessarily feel healing or restorative. It's, it's like, I know I can do it. I'm going to do it. Um, but why is the question? And so I really love your approach to that. And, and also thank you for bringing up the menstrual cycle and, um, the, the, the impact that that has in terms of how we can optimize our health and how we can use different tools at different times. And for anyone listening to this, we're almost out of time, so we probably won't get to go too in depth on it in this conversation, but you have so many amazing episodes on your podcast that really get into the details of this. So I really encourage everyone to listen to those. There's such amazing um, resources and tools. Um, in terms of exercise and strength training, you know, growing up, I was one of those people, I was a runner. I always equated like working out hard and running with, you know, cardio, like sweating, that it wasn't really a workout and exercise unless I was pushing really hard. It's really only more recently that I've gotten into strength training and I've recognized that as being really, really important. Um, I think there's so much confusion though from women and misunderstandings around strength training, whether it's that they think they'll get bulky or they'll gain weight. Um, what is your approach to strength training? Um, what are some things that you feel like you often have to clarify <laughs> with your clients? Um, and, and can strength training actually replace cardio? Like if you only have enough time to do something three times a week, should it be strength training? Oh, these are great questions. I used to also be, so the way that I actually paid for my professional schooling was I was a step instructor. So I'm totally dating wow. myself, but like if <laughs> any of you remember the step, like I was the step queen. Like I <laughs> loved all the choreography and the three knee repeaters and all the things. So, um, okay. So I, I think that, um, cardio is important. So I'll start off by saying that cardiovascular work is important. We do need to be thinking about training the cardiopulmonary system as we age, right? Because we do see if you're not doing, if you're not active enough, and a lot of people are not active enough, we do sort of see this like exponential fall off in terms of like uh, oxygenation capacity. I used to see this all the time in the clinic where I would just pop on like just a little... Uh, 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 like a, a oxygen meter almost on the, on the tip of the finger. And we, it's called an oximeter and we'd be watching for oxygen saturation because if there's going to be any problems, you're going to see it at the distal extremities, right? You'll see it at the fingers or the toes or whatever. And I remember there was this one patient, he comes to my mind and it was like 10 o'clock in the morning. We were doing like a new patient and his, his oximeter was reading out at 96%. And it's like, you're young. What is happening? And so I redid it. So I was like, this is, the, the machine's like drunk, like this, there's no way that this is right. And kind of redid it a couple of times with the same, with the same readout. So, um, cardiovascular, uh, training is important. I also think that we, as women, we overdo it because we've been sold this idea that, you know, especially in the context of weight loss, right? Like cardio is going to burn calories. And it's like, yeah, when you are a runner, you know, and I used to like, I love that you said like, it had to be hard. It's like, for me, it was like, if there wasn't a bucket nearby, you know, <laughs> like if I wasn't vomiting after the workout, then it didn't count. Right. Like that's the kind of like, I don't know, you know, maybe you can, uh, think about like, gosh, that poor, like what goes on inside that woman's head for her to mm. <laughs> think that it has to be that extreme all the time. But there's so many women mm -hmm. that are listening to this, that feel the same way that if I don't, if my heart rate doesn't get up to 180, you know, mm -hmm. on the bike, on the Peloton or on the whatever class, like I, it, or I'm at orange theory or whatever it is. And it's like, I'm not pushing myself, then it, it didn't count. And mm -hmm. I think that, um, cardio, as I was mentioning, burns calories. But when you are doing the bike or you're running or you're doing sprinting or whatever it is, your body is going to adapt to whatever stimulus you're giving it. So you will pare down. You will use, unfortunately, you will use, if you're going too hard for too long and too often, you will start to use muscle tissue as a source of energy if you're not fueling yourself properly. So mm -hmm. strength training for me uh, is the foundational if we think about like a movement program and if we think about it like a Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Like what's at the bottom, it's strength training. 
it's a hundred, if it's, a, if we're thinking about movement practices, it's a hundred percent strength training. Um, especially this is true as we age, right? One of the things that happens as we get older naturally as a consequence of aging is that we just start, if we're not doing anything about it, we start to lose uh, lean muscle mass. So we will start to lose, we actually not just lean, like lean mass in general. So we start to see bones start to get thinner and more frail and more brittle. Uh, we will pare down, uh, the amount of muscle mass that we have organ tissue or like everything kind of gets smaller. If we're not doing anything about it, if we're not activating those nerve, uh, growth factors, let's say. So, um, if someone only has three times a week for 45 minutes, I would actually say a hundred percent of that should be strength training. And then we should, maybe we should be looking at, um, at other ways for them to get in low levels of activity through the day. So maybe when they go grocery shopping, they park at the end of the lot, right? And then they have to walk a little bit further and then they kind of make their way through the grocery store and walk all the way back. Or maybe they don't take the elevator, they take the stairs. Or, you know, there's a little app on their phone. Every hour on the hour, they get up for like a five minute or a 10 minute movement break, you know, something like that. A movement snack actually is, is uh, the word that I, I love to use. So movement snacks. So um, Strength training is important. We become, and the other thing that I will also mention as we age is that we become, the tissue actually becomes less and less receptive to stimulus. So if you're not doing anything about it, you, it's almost as you age, you have to do more to continue to maintain the signal and to maintain the tissue that you have, right? Building muscle is actually very energetically expensive uh, for the body to do. So it will get rid of it if there's no need for it. Mm. So I think that when we are thinking about resistance training, uh, I would say three times a week, well, you know, maybe if it's like, if there's no way that someone can do three times a week, I would say, you know, two times a week is the bare minimum. And if no one can do two times a week. I'd say, well, one time a week is the bare minimum. <laughs> you know, like three, if, if someone only has three times a week, I would say, and it's 45 minutes, you can actually design your weight training sessions to also give you a cardio, like a, you know, a cardiovascular benefit, right? Like if I'm wearing a heart monitor when I'm doing legs, like, you know, during the set, you know, when my muscles are under tension and I have that mechanical load, like my heart rate shoots right up, right? It comes up like 140, 150, sometimes 160. And then it comes like, you know, finishing the set, it comes back down, right? So you can absolutely derive a cardiovascular benefit from training. So it's kind of an efficient way, um, if you are very limited in time. And then once you get into the rhythm of doing three times a week, then if you are working with me, I'm going to try to find another 45 minute session somewhere for you to get to four. Cause three is good. Like three is pretty good. I would say that that's like the minimum sort of viable signal, like minimum viable dose to like maintain that mechanical signal. That's telling your body, Hey, like this tissue is important. We need to protect it. Uh, four is better. Mm -hmm. Strength training has definitely been an inspirational thing for me to try to incorporate um, because in addition to the health benefits, which I think are undeniable at this point, I also just feel better when I feel yeah. strong. Yeah. Like I don't think I ever realized, especially as a runner, my upper body was so weak my whole life. And, and unfortunately, I think sometimes that's actually glorified in women, that concept of like being, I don't know, like just really thin in that way. And it really doesn't feel good. This is my perspective. Like I agree with, I could not agree with you more. There's, if there's one thing, you know, and I'm speaking to my own type A personality and, and probably, you know, the type A's that are listening, if there's one thing that I don't like is not having control. Like I don't like not being able to pick up, you know, if I'm traveling, like I want to be able to pick my, you know, that little rotating thing when you're waiting <laughs> for your bags. Like I want to be able to grab my own bag. Like I don't need to, I don't want to have to ask somebody like, Hey, can you help me grab my, mm -hmm. you know, my bag or, or what have you. So I think about it from that perspective. I love feeling strong. You know, my goal this year, I can, I can punch out about seven pull-ups right now. I want to get to wow. 12 by the end of the year. That's that my is... own personal stated goal, but there's nothing, there's like nothing more satisfying than being able to pull up your own body weight. There's that self-trust. There's that like love for yourself. There's that reverence that you have for your body. Like, gosh, like I'm so happy I could do this. Like, I feel so <laughs> happy. Like it, it, that's the, it's like happy, happy and proud. And I think when you can initiate that joy and that pridefulness around your body. Uh, I mean, that for me is kind of what's kept me like I first I've been weight training, you know, for decades at this point. Now I've competed in, you know, shows and stuff, but I, I feel like 
what's kept me like, and I originally got into it because I wanted to look good. Like, it's like, I want to look good in bikini. <laughs> I want to, you know, but what, what's kind of kept me here is some of the mental benefits, um, around feeling strong and learning about what I'm capable of. I mean, that is, you know, you want like a personal development program, like build a body, like mm -hmm. try to put on muscle because there's going to be days that you wake up and you're not going to want to train and you have to do it anyway. You know, it's on your schedule. It's like set, you know, this is what I have for the week. So I think that there's, uh, for me anyway, like some of the mental benefits of weight training, like the self-love, the self-acceptance, uh, needing mm -hmm. to modify the squat to, you know, the way that my hips, like my, the anatomy of my hips, like I have really long femurs. So I have to kind of change the way that I squat in order, like in order to squat low enough or else I just kind of like hit a wall. <laughs> if my feet are fate, like if my feet are just all pointed forward, like I, there's a point where I just can't, <laughs> like I just, <laughs> my hips are like banging up, like all my bones are hitting against each other. So I have to kind of flare my feet out a little bit. Um, so I've learned a lot about myself and my mechanics and what I'm capable of and how strong I can get. And I recently joined a gym, actually. I have a, I've just trained at home for many, many years. And it's, it's really a really great feeling as a woman to like going for the same weights as the guys are. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I don't know what, I don't know what it is about that. And maybe that's just my ego, but it's like, yeah, I like that I'm doing the same as the guy beside me on the bench. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. completely. And just to feel, like you said, to feel that you have your own power that you yeah. have control over your body, that you have strength. My current goal is to do 20 clean, really good push-ups, And I'm Beauty. almost there, Beauty. but it's, it's not a huge goal, but it's something where I was like, I should be able to do 20 push-ups. Like every, in my opinion, every woman <laughs> should be able to do that. Um, and next up is pull-ups for me. So I'm going to take inspiration from, from your goal. Um, thank you that. so much for coming on. Like I said, for, for everyone listening to this, there is so, so, so much information that you share on your podcast. Um, that I think is just so valuable. We didn't even get to touch on so many things um, for people listening, whether it's menopause, a lot more into hormonal stuff and, and specifics around ideas and kind of tailoring for women. I mean, there's just everything on their mental health, sexual health. I really, really appreciate everything that you're doing and all the conversations that you're putting into the world. Oh, thank you so much, Lauren. I had such a great time. Happy to come back uh, if there's if there's a need or desire for it. I know my menopausal ladies are always like, what about me? <laughs> <laughs> totally. So, I would love to have you back and maybe just something even specifically on that topic because there's not nearly enough attention given and the attention that is given is often negative, um, which is so, so behind the times. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think that's the best right. way I can put it. It's it's ridiculous the way that we think about these different seasons in a woman's life from the teenage years all the way through. Um, so I would love to have you on and have a conversation about that. In the meantime, where can people find you? Sure. Yeah. So um, the podcast, as you've mentioned, is called Better with Dr. Stephanie. So just uh, as a whole new level, wherever you are listening to the show, you can you can find mine as well. I uh, wrote a book about a lot of the concepts that we're talking about. It's called The Betty Body, named after The Better Show. So my better fans often call themselves Bettys. And I was like, oh, that's cute. You know, so we have The Betty Body, how to create kind of like your best, you know, balancing your hormones and thinking about diet and thinking about training and sleep and all of that. And then I'm pretty active on Instagram. So you can find me at uh, Dr. First Name, Last Name. So Dr. Stephanie Estima uh, on Instagram. And I, I try to post there almost daily. Sometimes the day gets away from me, but I'm usually there several times a week. <laughs>